thank you for that um, warm introduction, Steve. So let's just move this along and we'll start off by um, approaching this in a series of layers. And the first layer is the management layer, the decision to actually make something happen. And we'll start off um, starting with a couple of definitions. We've got our high performance computing, which unsurprisingly, as the name implies, is particularly good at performance. Um, a number of um, com pieces of commodity server hardware um, held together with a high speed interconnect and um, typically operating in a Teamster mode with a, um, a separation with a um, management node for the sysadmins to live and for a login node for people to sit in, um, submit in and submit their jobs as necessary. As we all know, um, we have got our cloud systems as well, which um, exist primarily well, for their ease, ease of management, for their flexibility, um, and with a historical precursor with virtualized um, hardware. However, um, clouds are not high performance. Um, they have got, can have um, very good performance. And the question that is typically faced is whether the improvement in flexibility is worth the small overhead costs that you will inevitably, inevitably face. As uh, mentioned by the last presenter, it is, um, it's, not all the cl it's not clouds all the way down. Somewhere there actually has to be physical machines. So these are very different, um, uh, very different technologies. So the idea of actually producing a hybrid um, initially raises a couple of eyebrows. And of course, we must emphasize here that we're talking about hybrid HPC clouds. Uh, we're not talking about um, a hybrid between public and private clouds or anything like that. Um, and when I was first introduced to this model, I grumpily said, but you know, this isn't going to have the sort of high performance that um, I like in the high performance computing world space. Um, but uh, then it was pointed out to me that the particular usage metric um, made a lot of sense. And I do like to suggest that this is perhaps the um, moment of management genius. Um, to actually do the user profile um, based on their metrics. Because you go out and you ask, you know, when you're building a new high performance computing system, um, you go out and you ask your users, what do you want? And they will always give you the same answers. They will say, we want more memory, we want more nodes, we want more cores, we want a faster interconnect. Um, you know what these answers are going to be. Uh, so the university was looking at, well, you know, do, do we actually want our own HPC system? Do we, or do we outsource it to the national facilities? And there's some good arguments on why you want some um, local um, HPC. Um, one of the most important ones, of course, is that you want to, um, you want to actually may, maybe need to do some really localised real, or even real-time processing. You might have a different policy approach on how you manage things. And you can always use the um, HPC facility that you have locally um, as a stepping stone to the national facility. So the argument came through, yes, we'll, we'll um, have a local HPC, but we're not going to give you much money for it. It's the story of our lives, you know. Um, so we, um, after actually doing that um, user um, survey, we also had a look at user metrics. And this is where things became really important. This is where you, where you will judge how much of your hybrid is going to be one or the other. And it just so happened that an enormous amount, um, enormous percentage, um, something like 75% of the jobs being submitted on our previous HPC system were single node. Now, HPC systems traditionally have a very high speed interconnect and those high speed interconnects cost a lot of money. So why do you need them if you've got a, a significant proportion of um, single node jobs? Well, of course, the answer is you don't and that money that you save, you could actually buy more cores and actually do what the users are really looking for, and that is reduced queue times. Because the situation is, if you've got lots of small jobs coming on, they're blocking the large jobs, or if you've got those very high performance jobs, then so like other jobs are missing out, unless you get some backfilling organised as well. Um, so best option is actually to build your system that is proportional to the usage that you have. And then at a later date, if that usage changes, then you can incrementally upgrade. So the very, very important thing being there is do those management metrics. 
Um, so we went off and said, hey, you know, what, where can we get this from? Just so happened we had um, a good allocation available because Nectar is a federation through the uh, Nectar Research Cloud. And the decision was made, hooray, we are going to build a small traditional HPC with a high speed interconnect. Um, and that will act as one partition and we'll have a larger partition which is uh, built from OpenStack um, virtual machines and we'll use that for primarily those single node, uh, single node jobs and the multi-node jobs um, can go into the um, traditional HPC uh, partition and everybody will be happy and indeed they largely are. So moving up Obviously, having made the decision to do this, now we've actually started to get some physical infrastructure on the, board, on the ground, and this is a quick snapshot of some of the components of our physical layer. So we have a fairly small, real uh, physical HPC. Um, they're quite powerful, quite powerful machines, relatively. Um, you know, we've got 12, we've got 12 cores there, 21 gig per core, and so forth. The cloud partitions, uh, the, cloud, the cloud partition, those virtual machines, um, a larger number of them, um, a larger number of cores, etc. And I've got an and statement there that has got a full stop after it, and that's incorrect, so I'll edit that later. Um, we also have a small GPU uh, partition, which is um, looking like it may get some fairly large expansion later in the year, and a couple of departmental partitions. So the advantage being is we've built this modular system which other people can come into, and rather having to administer the entire system themselves, they can say, well, look, you know, you've already got this um, Spartan HPC system. Um, we don't want to have to sort of like do the systems administration for our, you know, small cluster of a dozen nodes or so. Can we attach that to your system as a partition and have our own private space? And of course, yes, you can. So it makes things easier for them. Um, we've um, got the net there's a network difference there. The cloud partition, of course, because it is, you know, best designed for those single node jobs. Um, has got um, a uh, slightly less powerful interconnect than our bare metal partition. And if you have a look at those speeds there, we did some um, testing compared, um, where we compared a you know, simple MPI ping pong test. And our previous HPC system, C system had um, you know, not 19, um, 19 microseconds latency there. Um, we also have our cloud partition obviously is up there at 60, so it's somewhat slower. And over the course of a year, when we decided to um, use our, conver our converged ethernet, um, we got a result of 1.15 microseconds. And I'd like to mention that that was actually faster than a control case that we had of a traditional HPC system that was using InfiniBand. All right? So that is faster than InfiniBand. So that's actually very, very cool. Um, Mount points, okay, another part of the physical layer stuff that you will absolutely need. So we have um, common uh, mount points across the system for home directories, for projects, um, uh, and for sort of course for user local. We do have um, different sort of like levels of scratch space for people to, for when they're running their MPI jobs to actually have shared storage and, um, and so forth. Um, each node, of course, has its got own local temp. Um, this is stuff which uh, we are working on and trying to build a bit uh, because um, you know, users love their space and um, if you give them space, they try to fill it up. So we're working on improving it. Um, in particular, we have to get um, uh, our projects directory um, built up and, of course, our scratch area um, as we start getting larger quantities of jobs as well. What's the next step you've got? Well, you've now got your physical hardware. Let's start deploying some stuff on it. And, of course, the first thing you want to do is employ an operating system. Um, you know, we all go, oh, yes, you know, everybody in the world, when you're building high-performance computing, you know, they lo love to, sort of like, use, um, you know, Linux. Um, but and it's become such a common thing that sometimes I think we forget about why we do this. All right? 
Um, very scalable operating system, very high performance, very well suited for research applications. You know, most scientific software has been written with this in mind. There is, you know, something like, um, you know, Linux built on Unix and Unix built on Multix. You're suddenly you're talking about 70 years of computer science. Um, the fact that it is free and open source is extremely important in the high performance computing world because we want to try to optimise the software as much as we can um, to ensure that you know, high performance is actually high performance and that we get some advantage out of every single clock cycle that we possibly can. So the fact that 99.6% uh, of the world's top 500 machines use Linux is no mistake. Um, it's not because the, all your HPC sysadmins are Linux crazed, it's because they've become Linux crazed because it is the um, best operating system for the task that is at hand. If anyone wants to build an operating system system that is better than that, please go right ahead. Um, on top of, the, of course, with the operating system, we need to have a job scheduler in your high performance, um, uh, high performance computing world, and the one that we've chosen here at University of Melbourne is Slurm. You have other options, of course. There's uh, PBS Pro, um, there is um, Talk and Moab. Um, if you're very exciting, you can try Open PBS and maybe Maui and things like that. But Slurm is now um, developed by Lawrence Livermore and the friends, um, it has become a very popular, uh, popular scheduler to take up. So. It looks, uh, it basically does, the, the Slurm workload manager basically combines the tasks of a job schedule and resource manager. We found that it's uh, been quite good for um, incorporating a lot of its accounting features. Um, the range of plugins that it's got is quite large. The fact that it's free and open source as well is very handy. And we've used it to uh, divide logical partitions which correlate. Um, not the same thing, but correlate with our hardware partitions. And you can have different compute nodes in different partitions um, uh, simultaneously. The power saving feature is actually quite an exciting one in its own right, um, insofar that um, it is also used, it's extended to actually employ um, a cloud bursting feature, which um, um, we will t uh, we'll talk about um, a little bit more further on. Um, another thing which uh, we've done, which um, I think is quite quite interesting, um, and this um, previously existed with um, some of the work on the um, uh, local Melbourne node of the Nectar Research Cloud, is the use of our version control configuration and our configuration management through Git, um, Garrett, and Puppet. Um, you know, obviously Git's like absolutely fantastic for like, you know, doing version control, but to actually version control your configurations is very handy as well. And Garrett creates this very interesting system for, um, for those of you who are sysadmins out there where, you know, people have been talking about paired programming for a long time, you know, getting two programmers to basically watch over each other's shoulder as they put together code. Um, but, you know, when you combine Git, Carrot and Puppet together in this sort of combined fashion, you actually end up with paired systems administration. So you can actually, sort of like, you know, ensure that something um, is being checked before it's actually being deployed, and that's actually um, very handy. Um, the Puppet process allows us to actually break up the sort of installations that we have on the different partitions. So you'll have a different range of software packages, for example, that are on the, um, on the management node or the login node compared to what you've got on the compute node or what you've got on the GPUs and so forth. And lo and behold, this is obviously pro not primarily an OpenStack talk because you know, this entire day is about OpenStack. Yes, we do do um, um, OpenStack um, node deployment because that should be fairly obvious um, for, because it's what we're about. So high performance computing is about, of course, um, trying to get um, those tasks to actually run in the best possible way. And um, obviously we um, try to build as many applications as we can um, using um, the source code you know, for better control over security integration development and also because we want to really improve that performance. That actually has become so critical 
you know, 25% improvement in performance is actually a big deal, even if it does take you a fair bit of time to install it, a particular package sometimes, because the first time that, you know, a user submits a 30-day job, well, that time is gained back. And 25% is, um, you know, fairly conservative. I have seen examples where um, uh, software applications have... Um, you know, um, have had uh, 10 times improvement in their performance simply because the thing has been built from source rather than the commonly available um, packaged manner. The other thing, of course, is that we want to allow for reproducibility. Um, so we need to keep track of uh, what version of the software has actually been installed because it doesn't help you when you're writing your research paper and you say, well, you know, um, we were doing this big statistical analysis and we were so like I'm um, using R and, oh, and about halfway through our process, the sysadmins decided to upgrade the package of R that we had on our, on our system. Um, that is software which is not very, uh, sorry, research which is not very reproducible and um, reproducibility is a very, very big issue in uh, science these days. Uh, in fact, I went to a talk uh, yesterday where it was uh, mentioned that um, if you pull two random scientific papers um, from journals out these days, th about half of them are reproducible. So how do you trust your science? Well, at least with some sense of actually it's like working on source code and very specified tool chains, um, you can actually make... Um, um, make, make that happen. Of course, building software from source can be trickier, um, the, a lot trickier than doing it by packages. Um, so there's this nice little creature called Easy Build. If you don't know about Easy Build, please do look it up. University of Ghent um, brought it out. And essentially, that basically takes a whole bunch of, bunch of the configuration components involved in software builds and bi basically builds a nice little like, Python script around it. Um, and they have blocks for the various compiler tool, com compiler tool chains. And it automatically creates environment modules um, for you using um, the Lua the more modern Lua version of our modules as opposed to the um, traditional uh, T uh, TCL version. Um, so this allows our users to dynamically change their system environment as they need, um, which allows, of, which of course from an admin perspective means that we can have multiple versions of the same software on the same system and we just switch between the module that we require at any particular point in time. So our researchers can have the consistency that they need when they're actually doing a research project on the software that they have or if they want to actually have a more modern version of a particular software application, they can say, well, can you install software X um, and please um, select like with you know, these particular extensions. So uh, we get the best of both worlds there. And as a result, we have quite a substantial range there. The usual range of suspects, Intel and GCC for the compiler world, a little bit of PGI there as well, several scripting languages, lots of um, versions of the Open MPI compiler suite, um, big applications, MATLAB, Gaussian, NAMD, R, OpenFoam and Octave. And for any of you providers of scientific software applications out there, please, produce your software with some um, standard auto configuration tools because I'm getting rather tired of people providing software with the assumption that we build clusters around their software rather than actually having software that's built for a generic cluster. Um, we have now over, uh, roughly about a thousand applications and versions um, built, installed from source plus a few packages here and there. Um, and we've also done, of course, containers with singularity. Uh, David carried this, ca covered this in, um, David Perry covered this in such some detail in the last presentation. Um, I won't, there are a number of other, pe uh, number of other people in this room who weren't at the previous. At, at that, at that, um, at that um, presentation. So effectively, we've um, got containers that are operating on the HPC as well. Um, and the reason, um, you know, to basically ensure that consistent environment versus that for, uh, for that system. Um, the reason why we don't have uh, Docker, um, as David mentioned, is because that um, basically requires um, it to be running as root, and um, we were, we're, we're suspicious of such things for um, good reasons. If we go up a level, 
users. Um, so we've got our own LDAP system uh, provided. Uh, we've got um, SAML is there as well. We did have, um, we did ex um, initially try to um, build around the university's Active Directory system, but there was a, a few issues with group enumeration, which was uh, less, <laughs> less than fun. Uh, my uh, my co co-worker Daniel was having a little chuckle there for very good reasons. Um, so we use Karagi, and if you are in the world of sort like looking after HPC clusters. This is a, um, uh, a Melbourne-based, a Melbourne-initiated project. It started off at the Victorian Partnership for Advanced Computing, which is uh, no more. Um, but um, basically, it allows us to do a range of uh, user, machine, and cluster, and um, uh, pro uh, project management um, through a Django-based Django, um, Django application. So it's really, really handy. Um, Okay, so we've got a help desk like most other help uh, most other most other systems. Um, I've just got to say, you know what users are like. They will um, ask you very strange things, like, can we run jobs um, from a data set that's stored in Queensland on the local HPC system? Yes, you can, but it's possibly not a good idea. Um, and and you know, oh my goodness, I've forgotten what my password was again, and all that sort of thing. Um, we like to reduce the quantity of um, re uh, requests that we get in. So one of the ways of doing this, of course, is to actually ensure that we have got online instructions and training. Um, so we've got, you know, basically a web page that takes people through the various steps, which is being uh, regularly updated. We have a man page on the system itself. People log in and they get their message of the day, which tells them all the usual stuff. And if they need a little bit of help, um, they can type in man Spartan and they get so like the instructions of um, how to submit a job and to what queue and so on and so forth. Um, we do run courses as well. We run day-long courses, intro to um, Linux and HPC, shell scripting, parallel programming, and we have got on the agenda a few specialist courses and applications for particular research groups. Um, so that sort of basically covers us from the principle of like starting off from how are we going to build um, a HPC system which combines um, traditional methods with um, an, o uh, an open stack deployment and to the point in which we've now got several hundred users on the system, 650 something I think at last count, um, about 270 odd projects and 800,000 jobs that have been run um, over the, um, what probably, I think we officially kicked off um, uh, June 30 last year. So what's left? Well, one of the great things that I have to say about the system, um, because we do actually even have stuff like the, the login nodes and the um, login nodes and the management node also run on virtual machines, is that we can be quite flexible on how we develop this. We've had a few meetings with our friends at um, Microsoft, and um, we think that we can basically integrate into Slurm a, an Azure queue, so we've got this um, allocation with um, Azure where people should be able to just like launch a job and it basically wraps um, any site data transfer that's necessary and runs it on, the, um, on Azure. And we're very, very close to getting that, um, getting that to happen. Obviously, it does not mount our shared directories um, across um, to wherever so like the Azure clou uh, cloud is operating from. Um, but of course, this is you know just part of the cloud bursting that feature which um, Slurm offers. It basically says, look, you know, um, we can have the we, we can have the um, use our power saving feature, and when you fire up a partition, it basically go, it can um, wrap that to so like point to a cloud service provider, and that can be pretty much um, anybody. So if there's you know a cloud service provider, um, you, and you just turn that into a uh, partition on. on Slurm and away you go. We have got a very big uh, plan to um, increase our GPU allocation. It's just a, a debate at the moment about where exactly that's going to sit. And um, so watch this space on that regard. Um, we have plans to build a, a test cluster. We do have 
test nodes and uh, for the cloud and physical partitions. Um, and we will probably be wanting to um, build that further. And finally, one of the nice things about this is that we can also introduce um, new CPU architectures relatively easily as well. So instead of actually having to build a completely new system, we can just have a new build node that's integrated to say, you know, say Skylake or something like that. And if applications make advantages of those particular um, CPUs, then we can rebuild software that takes those advantages and include that as a resource um, in there. A couple of gotchas and things that we learnt along the way. Um, we we did a bit of a tour of Europe last year to, to visit the HPC centres there, and they told us that um, what was um, you know, what they were doing, and we were quite surprised to discover at Freiburg University they actually have got a similar sort of system as well, except they're basically using their HPC cluster nodes as basically places to launch, um, places to launch VMs, whereas we're using the VMs as, place, as basically ways of actually deploying, uh, deploying um, HPC compute nodes. Another thing that we discovered is please, please, please turn off overcommit because um, HPC jobs are resource intensive um, and you will get things, nasty things like time at mismatch errors. So overall, things have worked out really, really well. Um, we've had a very successful um, system and I think if you want to actually combine the features of performance and flexibility, uh, this is the way to go. And thank you very much and I won't keep you away from lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Lev. Um, any questions? We've got three or four minutes. <laughs> Ta -da. That, that, that was that was um, that meeting was only last week. <laughs> I, I saw you mentioned Git Garrett, yep. Manage Puppet. Great idea of doing that. Um, you didn't cover specifically how you solve that problem in your build infrastructure. Uh, is it an assumption that you're actually using Git and version control to manage the third-party software that you build from software? Um, okay, so it depends, depends on the software in question. Um, for example, we, this is only for packages when we're actually building nodes. Um, or, you know, sort of like changes to sort of like, you know, some of the configuration options as well. Um, so... So when you're actually build, building so like a whole range of software applications, we use Easy Build instead, and we don't actually have to so like, you know, put in a, you know, this is how we're going to do it on something, uh, something like that. We just you know, get one of the admins, either myself or Daniel, to go through that process. But you build control and manage that building good architecture? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Mm. Also the tool chain, which is, can, can make an, a big difference because, you know, I mean, the software that you build with one compiler may not actually have exactly the same results as the software built from another. Got time for one more question before lunch? Anyone? Huh. Well, Lev, and as you can see, there's various others that have been oh, nice. involved with this project um, are around for further detailed questions over lunch. So thank you, everyone, thank you. and see you in an hour back in the Innovation Education Stream. <laughs> <laughs>